Hello and a warm collision is YYC. Welcome to my guest this morning, Ms. Carolyn Berglund. How are you doing, Carolyn? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. We've been chit-chatting away and uh, just talking about every, everything under the sun. So we thought we better push record as I, as I often go, oh shit, we need to let the audience in. <laughs> we need to let them hear this amazing whatever it is we're going to talk about. Uh, speaking of talk, uh, your company is called Talk Talk and you're the principal there. So let's jump in the elevator a couple floors. Hey, Carolyn, nice to meet you. What's Talk Talk? What's all about? What do you guys do? And uh, let's launch from there. Yeah. So uh, Talk Talk is a boutique consulting firm uh, based here in Calgary, although I, as I was telling you earlier, kind of travel wherever. We play in a bunch of different arenas, including um, leadership, uh, team development. We're doing a ton in team development right now, Tyler, because I think teams, frankly, are in crisis. Um, we also uh, play in the arena of executive coaching. And finally, um, kind of a new branch, our new arm to Talk Talk is helping others be better public speakers. Hmm. Wasn't it the biggest, um, the second biggest fear to death, only to death, or maybe second to death is public speaking for a lot of people? It's is that amazing. a Seinfeld joke from way back? It is true. The audience would rather be dead than standing up on stage. It is true. <laughs> and you know, it, interesting that if you had said to the 19 year old version of Carolyn that you would be speaking in front of people in podcasts or in keynote talks or workshops, I would have, I would have laughed. <laughs> There's no way I would have thought I would. Have You've got the wrong girl. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh no. Oh no. That's not, I won my first public speaking contest in grade six on how to make maple syrup. As we were talking earlier about our, 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 our both having spent a lot of time in Quebec. So Wait, hold on. Quebec, how so. long was that talk? Uh, I don't remember. I'd have to look back. I just have a very clear memory of standing up on stage. I was at a, a my little elementary school that used to be a high school back in the day. So it had a proper auditorium with the stage and the curtains and you walked out and, and I did this talk and, and my mom coached me on doing it. I just I have this image of looking out into the audience. I can't see anybody, but I can still picture myself being on stage. And that's all I really remember about it. And I'd kind of forgot until I got back into speaking. And then my mom, of course, as my mom does, as moms do, goes, Hey, remember that talk you won? And I was like, so yeah, that's where I started my public speaking career and a lot of hiatus in between, but yeah, it was all the way back to grade six. <laughs> Do you remember if you were nervous though? Like going back to this is the number I one absolutely fear. remember being nervous. Yeah. I remember like it, the feeling, yeah. like to your point of yeah. like memories and what impacts you and yeah. what anchors, right? Yeah. That feeling of like being out on stage and doing the thing. And I still remember my mom coached me at the end. I forget what the line was, but she coached me to like deliver it with like enthusiasm. And I felt so silly, but I like did it and like, yeah, maple syrup, like something like that. <laughs> Which if you see me on stage now, it's like, I'm always putting on a show. If I have to keep my hands at my side, I can't speak. That's also growing up in Quebec. You're always swinging your arms around telling stories. But uh, my mom coached me on how to like be and like be memorable and make a big splash and do the thing when I was in grade six. And you won. That's funny. I haven't really told this story besides a vague memory for a long time. <laughs> it's a great story, but it's also Anyways, a Anyways, back to you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I totally sabotaged your intro, but I'm like, wait a second. They are speaking as you're younger. So I love it. Leadership, team development. I want to touch on something you said. Teams are in crisis. Um, I'm going to just throw something out here that someone asked me, what's like one of the buzzwords that you hate the most right now? This is, and just, I answered very quickly the term high performing team, because I think it's mostly a bunch of bullshit where a bunch of people get bolted together, told to do a lot of work in a short period of time and be called high performing. <laughs> so I'm going to throw it out there bold, being a bit bold early on thoughts on that statement. Do you run into that? Are we actually setting people up to be high performing one individuals or oh, teams? Sorry. How does that lean back to your team development of like teams in crisis? I'm smiling. I don't know if people are going to see this or not. Almost they chuckling, can hear it in your voice. Chuckling <laughs> inside because most of the organizations that I've worked with in the last, let's call it 15 years, throw down that term high performance team. And I agree with you. How do you define that? Um, no idea. Um, I think each team is completely different and to, to kind of have this blanket overarching statement that, you know, is the utopia of what one should be on a team, I think is quite silly. I mean, if we go back to teams being in crisis, like just to go back to that, I think that pandemic candidly, and I'd love to hear your perspective has, has really changed how teams interact with one another. Um, and there has been no water cooler talk. I mean, during the pandemic, and one might think, like, I don't know about you, I was on an aircraft last week, I was telling you earlier that I'm flying a lot, 
You spend a lot of time on aircraft. Yeah, right? and nobody has their masks on anymore, or you see the occasional one. And we're almost forgetting that this global thing happened. And what I think, I think I might argue that we're all trying to forget. We're all or, trying. Or doing our best to forget. Yeah, we're doing our best. To, yeah, but I think we, someone brings it up, and you're like, oh, I don't want to even like. I just want to pretend that didn't happen. Exactly, <laughs> but it did happen. I think we did. should remember because the, what the pandemic did for teams, I think, obviously, it was horrible, horrible, you know, thing. But what it did do for teams was it showed, and I'm, this is not going to sound like a very common thing to say in leadership, but teams showed each other some love, right? Like you, you were on yeah. Zoom calls and your boss was like, or your colleague was, hey, I understand you have you know, a child with special needs or you have a kid in palliative care or you, whatever the situation was, we actually showed some vulnerability with one another. Um, we all be, we all became a little bit more human, right? And we showed the, the humanity. things that I wouldn't have tolerated, like the like that I would have found annoying. Of like, oh, your kid just ran through the back of a Zoom call wearing a diaper <laughs> on its head. I, would, I wouldn't even like that. That's a real thing. We've all seen a version of that, whatever it is. Um, and I, in the past, I would have been a bit like shitty and condescending to that. Like, oh, come on, be professional. And now I couldn't even care less. Totally, <laughs> like, I would laugh. I would just laugh and think it was funny. Totally, or people being emotional, where you would have thought, well, that's unprofessional. Whatever that emotion There's no crying, was. In, there's no crying in baseball. Yeah, w- exactly. whether it be anger or crying or whatever that emotion was. I mean, Emo- emotions. Yeah, emotions, emotions mm-hmm. broadly. And so, my big concern, Tyler, is that we're going to be going. I, I, I see it. We're going back to the way we used to be. This command and control. Mm-hmm. To back to your earlier point around high performing teams, now we're starting to throw these buzzwords out again and focusing on objectives, 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 goals, 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 all of this, you know, you know, corporate speak. Again, what do you think high performance teams means so, to you, Tyler? Oh, that's such a good question. And I actually had an executive speaker um, come in and, I, and I, I'm, I'm like looking through my nose. I got to go find it. But it was like it was a certain number of people. There was clear operating guidelines. There was mutual understanding of who did what in the role. There was a very clear understanding of what success looked like and what it wasn't. There was a very specific feedback loop and a way to generate engagement with the team. There was a cadence of connection. It, it was he defined it. It was um ex uh, uh, Raptor pilot. So as a guy, or maybe a girl as well. I love. I'm like your ex military used to fly fighter jets. I've got all the time in the world to listen to your story. So this was his how we entered the room, and he and he was like the the he went hard at the fact that majority of teams are not high performing. They're just a, they're work groups that are bolted together, forced to meet unrealistic expectations and called high performing. He's <laughs> like, if you try that in a military environment with high performance aircraft, everybody dies. I'm like that's what happens. Yeah. So he broke it down that way. And he had it very, very clearly defined in a lot of like, what are the parameters? What does success look like? How do we deal with conflict? What are we actually going for? Who actually knows how to do what and what's their strength and where can we tap into them for? And there was like eight points, and this was through a study that he had brought in through the U.S. that he identified was two individuals had said, this is actually what a high-performing team looks like. And there was a a limit to the amount of numbers. But what I loved about it was all of the operating procedures of how we do things, especially how we deal with conflict or misalignment or changes in direction, was all laid out in advance. He goes, then and only then can you perform at a high level when you know what the operating guidelines are and everyone's agreed to it. And has respect of each other in the process. And I really liked it because there was some guidelines and I've rarely encountered that, quote unquote, in the real world. Yeah, I would, in the civilian world. I would say the term high performance team is too ambiguous. I, I mean, I know that we're moving the conversation into trust and psychological safety. And I would rather mm-hmm. say, are you on a psychologically safe team than a high performance team? Mm-hmm. Because those to me would be synonymous. However you would say high performance team, however you measure success, whatever those KPIs or goals are, would naturally unfold if I think you're on a truly psychologically safe team and environment. Hmm, that's a good point. Are you hearing, is that term, I'm hearing that term used a lot by people that that go in to coach people to do it. I'm not hearing it in a corporate setting. I'm not, I'm not meeting a new client. We meet clients all the time. Oh, what's it like here? And how's the process? And you know, we're really trying to, oftentimes when we're scoping, 50% of the scope is what are you going to be like to work with? Yeah. The, fifth, the work is usually fairly straightforward-ish, but I've never heard them say, oh, we have a psychologically safe environment. Because I'd be like, oh, wow. Okay. Let's talk about that. I've never had anyone explain what it would be like to work with them in those terms or yet. I hope it's going to happen tomorrow, but I haven't run into it yeah, as, a I, as, a, as someone who's often in a consulting role, which I'm sure you, you are as well. 
I am. Um, and I think I bring it up with my clients. I mean, psychologically, psychological safety isn't a new term. I mean, it was coined in the 60s, right, with a couple um, organizational psychologists that kind of gained momentum with Khan. Then it went through Amy Edmondson, who I would say is the queen of psychological that's the, safety. That's the name I hear the most in context to when, it, when it's brought and up. She really, I think, uh, reemerged it. And then there's a fellow by the name of Timothy R. Clark that I, I quite admire that has really been playing around with the, the term as well. So I don't think it's it's not new, but it's been, I think, mm. since the pandemic in particular has really emerged as kind of a human right. So I think when we think about the job market, I think, and, and people, you, you hear about the great resignation and all these different things. I think yeah, employees, all, the, all the buzzy corporate, whatever, synergy, all this stuff. <laughs> um, I think people are really looking at that as a, a must have. Like it's no longer, wouldn't that be nice to be on a team where, you know, I can show up and be authentically myself. And pain, that's essentially what psychological safety is. Well, because not essentially being yourself is also exhausting in its own right. <laughs> right. So, Wearing this mask is very exhausting. So what I'm also hearing, if I'm going to, of course, put my own thoughts into it, is as we became more human, because really what we're talking about, psychological safety really shouldn't be applied to the workplace. It should be your life. Yeah. Because you want to feel like that all the time. This like, well, my life is like this and this is the way it is. But when I go to work, all that gets put aside and I get treated like shit and yelled at. No, like that. If that's in your in your personal life too, that's another challenge. But this feels like, to your point, these are universal kind of human rights. If I'm going to be, that's maybe bold to say that. But I want this at home, and I want it to work. I don't want there to be an A and B version of me that has to do. Well, with it's interesting because in the work that I do with leaders, and um, oftentimes if I'm doing executive coaching, we might start with some kind of assessment tool, right? Sometimes it, mm -hmm. you know depends. And a lot of these assessment tools have a natural place and then um, an adaptive space that you might find yourself on the tool. So the natural space is who I am at home. This is me authentically being who I am. And then um, some of these tools will say, this is, but this is how you behave at work. And it's pretty dramatically different than who you are. The truth is it feels really uncomfortable if you have to play one role, that mask that you just talked about. Um, at work and a different one at home, it's exhausting. And in fact, when I kind of, you know, take a step back and pause, I think the reason why people leave organizations is one, leaders, but two, if that that um, delta is too big. Is there just for the devil? I, I think I've I I became unemployable a long time ago, so I've been running my own <laughs> because I want to be me, me and I want to create the. Me too. Yeah, so, <laughs> so because sometimes we'll talk about this, people are like, "Well, that's nice for you because you you do your own thing." I said, "Well, yeah, but I still have to. I I still have to answer clients, and I still have a team, and all those things." Is there an argument though for the fact that it can be different, but it's in the ways that it's different? Because work is work, and and home is home. And I, maybe I'm weird and quirky and like to wear underwear on my head at home. That maybe that doesn't make sense at work. Sure. But there are certain. But what we're talking about is kind of base level of humanity of like, you deserve to be treated in a certain way and you deserve to feel comfortable and safe to be who you are, but maybe you can't wear your underwear on your head at work. And right. So we're picking on that one, it picturing my three-year-old niece running around with her underwear on her head, <laughs> but it's okay to be different. But what we're talking about is the non-negotiables. Is that a safe way to kind of put some yeah, parameters on Yeah, I would that? say like for those that are listening, um, the way I would look at it is think I came across here, let me go back. I came across a picture of myself when I was four years old, um, a couple weeks ago. And I looked at that picture and there Carolyn is, is being super expressive and big in her body language and emanating energy. And I looked at her and I said, well, the four-year-old version of Carolyn is pretty similar to the 52-year-old version, but I had to find my way back there. Because what ha oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. what's like happened that. is that you know, we get imposter syndrome. We go, oh, I can't create. I can't be curious. Or like When you're four, you, you sit in a bunch of Legos and you just do it. You don't go, well, I'm not going to do it because I can't be a Picasso, right? Like you, you just do it. And so, um, yeah, I think that, yeah, what was it? <laughs> I forgot where we were going. Yeah. Well, what we're really talking, the balance of like what is work and what is home. But what I love where you went with like, you know, it took you X amount of years to get back there. Yeah. You know, four-year-old view versus 52-year-old yeah. view. And we get in these environments that 
and we get shitted on. We we should, and we do it to ourselves. I should act this way, and I yeah. should act that way, and I can't, and I shouldn't. Yeah, and that doesn't work. Yeah. But oftentimes, when you when you the closer you are to yourself, is often where the magic kind of does happen, and the big ideas come out, or you do something that felt effortless because you were in your in your flow, or you know, we can bring in all the different <laughs> all the different um, ways of explaining it, but. Getting in that flow, whether we talked a little bit about about speaking and getting on stage, like there's a rhythm and there's a flow to that. That if you're trying to be someone else, oh, it just doesn't work. The audience sees through you like in two seconds. <laughs> but let's be honest, Tyler. I mean, it's a real vulnerable move to be yourself, mm. to show up and to be authentically who you are. And that was the point with you're the right. four-year-old version. Sorry, I had a brain fart there. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I was like, I was like, I think I can pull that. Away, <laughs> I do. I, 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 I do, you know, and I also joke sometimes when it comes to uh, learning new behaviors or getting, getting over, like when's the last time you asked a six-year-old for advice kind of every day. Yeah. Cause you picked up some, but how can you take the good stuff from there? And maybe not the stuff that you stuffed down when you were six, when someone told you that you weren't this or you were that. And then you've been carrying that around for another 40 years. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. We'll do that one. <laughs> um, so when you're working with like, like, you show up in, a, in an executive leadership team. I'm, I'm going to use my I'm going to use my adult voice. Yes, we're very mature true. at this company. Yes. We do professional things. Yeah. We make things. We're very we're very serious. Yes. And you make a reference to your four year old self, and the CEO or the VP or the engineer or the account looks at you and goes, "Well, this is some fluffiness. This is some silliness here. I just don't have time. I'm this is we do serious things here. Is and I'm I'm being very dramatic for the sake of the, the bit here. How do you?" Like, is that a big factor of just also getting people to let down that guard back to your point about that gap analysis in the early days to go, okay, let's just relax here for a minute and let's maybe talk about some of the things that might be going on. Or is, is that some of that hard work or by the time you get the call, they know something needs fixing and they're willing to maybe be vulnerable. Maybe not. (laughs) Yeah. Most of the teams, Tyler, that I work with, I know this is going to sound quite, um, crazy but most of the teams i work with i don't take on unless they commit to 18 months to two years okay and the reason why i do that is i don't believe in events i don't think i can bomb in and bomb out now keynote talk i do that for sure and hopefully the hangover of that is that someone feels motivated at least for a short period of time well yeah that's an opportunity for them to have a a window into your world and go hey i'd like to hang out there for a little while and then it turns into something bigger yeah hopefully right but ultimately from a biz dev perspective if not you get to share a cool idea and maybe they walk away going huh that was interesting and they just carry it around and ponder it for six months yeah but to go back to your earlier soft skills hard skills i think the soft skills really are the hard skills and most of the people that i've worked with have been promoted into uh leadership roles because they have the technical aptitude so they find themselves you know in this new leader role going oh boy I actually have to collaborate and communicate and do all this other stuff, which for, candidly is not kind of talked about on that leader journey until, um, you know, someone like myself perhaps comes uh, on board. So we get together every couple of months, take a break to go back into the real world, world to apply some of those concepts, come back together again um, and do that. Like I said, 18 months to two years, I, I would conjecture to say that it's pretty impossible to change behavior in a one and done kind of environment because those soft skills take time and practice. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of how I unfold. Well, they're, they're new, they're new muscles, they're new neural pathways. Like however you want to break that down, new behavior is like to, to learn it, understand it, learn a framework of doing something and then being able to actually apply it in the moment when there's maybe some emotion, maybe there's some imposter syndrome, maybe you feel a certain way. Ooh, those old grooves in your brain are much easier to follow. There's a quote talk about it from a neural neuroplasticity for sure. Oh boy, we could go yeah, down that. Like, well, well, uh, there's a whole other wow. rabbit hole we can go to go down that. Yeah. <laughs> you have no idea. Sorry, as soon as I started to say it, I'm like, oh, I might dial back. We're too. We're only ten minutes in. People are like, what are you guys talking about now? <laughs> well, we'll get there in a second. But there is a quote that I think you would like that I actually um, talk about all the time. It's by Peter um, Zeldin. I don't know if you know who that feller is Ooh, doesn't ring a bell Just but a please, historian, I love course, so. you know um but why i kind of started on the journey of of being obsessed and i don't think it's i don't i don't think it's an understatement for the last let's call it 15 years on trust and psychological safety was i mm-hmm. heard this statement which is when will we make the same breakthroughs in the way we treat each other as we have made in technology so think about like Ooh, computers, I've never heard that before. I love internet, that. GPS. GPS was 
very much created for Carolyn Bourbon because I can't find anywhere. Um, <laughs> social media, even go back to the telephone or the light bulb, right? Like when are we going to make the same significant changes in tech that and in the way we treat each other? And um, I've never heard that. That's so powerful. Yeah. And I, you know, I think I was telling you the last time we were chatting that I, you know, I spent a good portion of my career in the big consulting houses. And mm -hmm. part of my responsibility in one of these big consulting houses beyond leadership was to um, kind of help run the engagement survey. So, you know, those big meaty surveys that are like, I mean, yes. back in the day, they used to be like a hundred questions. So at least now they have pulse surveys or whatever. Um, so well, now you'd never get that much time from someone in a minute. Like there'd be zero chance. You'd never get that much to, like, to right? ask them, answer that many questions. I would like, I'm going to say a bold. You're halfway through another 10 minutes to go. Click, close, <laughs> close the window. I'm done. I'm done. I personally think the survey is dead, but outside voice, yeah. um, just go talk to your people. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, what's really cool right now? Having conversations. It's, right? it's this new crazy thing. You should try it. It's called talking and it's called one-on-one -on -one, and it's called meaningful conversations. Right. <laughs> but yeah. I'm a big fan of the meaningful conversation. Part. But back to that, that's also my tendency. My, my goal has been to get better at those over time, but my tendency is to not want to have those conversations. The getting better part, maybe even never gets to show up too. Like I just want to respect sometimes you know, when you're building on, oh yeah, I love talking to people. Oh, and now I'm going to learn how to actually be present and be good at it and show up for them. But if you don't even want to talk to people in the first place, that's a tough one. It is a tough one. And I think a lot of organizations and those that may be listening, I, I, I'd like you to think about why you're doing a survey, right? Um, you know, why not go to your point and just have a, have a conversation? Um, yeah. Because it's a great way to say I did something, Carolyn, without really doing my, my personal opinion. Exactly. You can, bingo. bingo. <laughs> well, we did a survey. Like, well, of course, they know we care. We did a survey. I'm like, really? Is that, what, is that the symbol of caring? But it's interesting because... <laughs> send, send, the, send your wife or spouse a survey and see how they feel about that caring message. Right? But our competitors <laughs> had a question that I thought was really fascinating that we didn't have. But I have friends in, in this competitive organization. Mm -hmm. And that question was, do you have a friend at work? And my strong guess is that you could go to that question and pretty accurately predict the overall engagement score based on the strength of that question. I've heard that before. Um, and that comes down to trust and psychological safety. Like, do you have someone in your orbit at, at your organization that you feel safe with? And I think the clincher is like, if you go home at the end of a long, hard day and you, and you have a spouse, let's say, or a partner or a friend, I mean, they can they don't really know the players at work, right? So they can empathize to some degree, but they can't really. It's that friend at work that really understands what you're going through. So having that um, trusting and friendships at work, I think really matter. And that's another reason why I think that pandemic was so profound is that it was tough to maintain those friendships on a zoom call. Yeah. You had to be very deliberate about it. You, you, you didn't have the bump in the office. You had to book a zoom call. And I, I, I remember my office manager challenged me, said, Oh, I just, I'm not as connected to the team. And she goes, well, Tyler, cause we used to, we had a team in Toronto and we still do. And we used to have an office. I'd go to Toronto and I'd take them all for coffee and just hang out with them. And she goes, well, why don't you just book coffee meetings? I'm like what, why wouldn't you just book that in zoom? So now I actually book a coffee meeting when I send them a coffee card just for because I would have bought them a coffee if we would have went out and, yeah. and I had to let them all know, Hey, all of a sudden the CEO books an appointment in your calendar. There's nothing clandestine. There's nothing to worry about. I'm just reaching out to have a chat with you. Yeah. And about half of them now, when I book it, will send me a coffee card before I get it this, before I can send it to them because it's their turn to buy. I didn't see that one coming and that warms my heart every time. That's, I love that. <laughs> Cause it, not cause I need a coffee card. It's because they, I see the value and I see that they get it. Yeah. And it's reciprocal. That's beautiful. But I had to get a kick in the ass to do that. I wasn't, I wasn't being deliberate about it to your point. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's pretty obvious, Tyler. Why wouldn't you do that? But I wasn't doing it during COVID in the early days. I didn't, I didn't get it. But then you did. I, I did. I got a, I, I like a good kick in the butt every once in a while. And I was just like, Tyler, I don't really understand why you're treating it different. Why don't you just do the same thing? But virtually I'm like, well, Julie, that sounds really obvious now that you said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started doing it right away. 
but to your point, I had to I had to make a new behavior. I had to create a new initiative because the parameters of the playing field changed. Yeah, it totally did. It's funny, Tevin, because um, during the pandemic, I was doing some roundtables with um, various CHROs as the pandemic started, just to kind of get a pulse on what what's happening out there. Um, and one of the CEOs that I was chatting with um, had two people that he had identified as successors for his role. And, um, you know, successor A was the person that was hitting the, the objectives pretty consistently, you know, the goals, goals, goals. Successor B really wasn't in, in going to get it. Um, so as the pandemic unfolded and he got, went to retire, he ended up choosing successor B. And I said, I thought, I thought successor B was not in the running. Like she was not getting the same results as, as, mm -hmm. as person A. And he said, you know, what was interesting is um, she showed vulnerability, caring, all of those soft skills that we've just said are hard skills that person A didn't. And they became the new leader competencies that was going to be able to run that company successfully. I thought, okay, this is changing the world of leadership in a pretty dramatic way um, for someone to choose the soft skills over the technical aptitude um, to run a company. And I'm seeing that over and over and over again. I don't know what you're seeing. That is a really, that's a really powerful example because short term also ties into our quarterly results and all of the things that we've become so addicted to. But the soft skills, it's like, great, you can get those, but at what cost? And, and great, if you hit a couple of numbers or hit a couple of quarters, but then you lose to some of your best people because you, they don't feel connected or you burn them out. To see the other one, is, to me, it just inherently has a much longer term vision of that this over the long term will be better for the organization. That's such a, that's such a, also a shift in terms of how we're looking out into the future and what will have a, a greater impact in the long run. I think I see that as a, not that the results are short term, but in corporate, they can be very short term, uh, very easily like tied into way too short of a cycle versus when you think about people, that's immediately a longer term conversation. That's actually a really good story. That's a great story. Yeah. I think the command and control leadership style, the one focused in on KPIs and objectives solely, I mean, obviously, I mean, Yes, we're not saying they're not important, they right? but there's other things that are also are. equally important. And they're, yes, they are course. really emerging as of equal importance. So I think the world looks different uh, post-pandemic as it relates to um, teams and psychological safety and, and leaders. And frankly, I think, you know, when I'm coaching people around succession planning uh, with organizations, those are the things that we're looking at. Do they have the ability to nurture environment? Um, of psychological safety where people can show up and be authentically themselves, where people can show up and make mistakes because frankly we're all human beings having a human existence. I, I haven't met perfect. I don't know if you have Tyler, but uh, I'd like to interview I, I definitely them. have not. I like, to use, we're, we're, I like to use the word messy. Humans are very messy yeah. and that's okay because it is part of it and the illusion of not being messy is what creates a lot of that stress sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Yes, the, the so when you come into a team, like what well, the, the gap analysis or the, the where are we now? And you, you said that very power, powerfully. I don't want to skip past it. For anyone looking, listening right now and looking at their own team, teams are in crisis. What are some of the things that show up for you? Like what, what are the, if you had, we had a dash, if we had a crisis, a team crisis dashboard, what would be flashing red when you first go into an organization where they're like, yeah, yeah, no, we're curious. We want to do better. You know, we've got some problems, but we're pretty good. You go in and go, oh, okay. I don't think you're maybe as good, whatever that is, as you think. What are some of the things that you see? What's, what flashes red on the dashboard? One of the first things that I look at when I go into a team is to see if there's conflict. And I don't know when conflict became a dirty word. Um, in fact, I would say in the absence of conflict, I'm pretty worried. So, you know, there's a fellow by the name of Patrick Lencioni that I, I quite enjoy. And he's got a pyramid and at the bottom of the pyramid. Oh, I love the pyramid. I could draw it out on my, on my paper right, right now. I've used it many times. You, got trust? you haven't read the five dysfunctions of a team. Pick it up and That's read it. That's it. I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah, pick it up and read because it. Because it's, it's <laughs> an it easy it. way to illustrate um how a team should perform right and at the bottom and and bottom of the pyramid or the yeah the triangle and the biggest part is trust then once you have trust they are afforded the luxury of going into conflict and so if you don't have trust you have something called artificial harmony you know where everybody's got uh-huh yeah uh-huh 
Now, I don't know about you. I've been on teams like that where it's not at all safe at all to speak up. Well, that's a classic example of the meetings that then happen afterwards or the actual meeting because no one's willing to say anything in the in the meeting you were in because there's no safety and you get all the backbenching and the politicking and the, 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 the conversations in the hallway about what we actually should have been talking about in the meeting. It's such a colossal waste of time, right? What if we could just it show is. up and be ourselves? We've established what, you know, that we all trust each other on the team. We're going to have impassioned, healthy debates. You know, then we can go into, you know, we're all committed and accountable and then you get results. What most yeah. teams. I love what you said, afforded the luxury of conflict. That's such a beautiful way to say. I love when you bolt words together that don't really usually go together. Right. You afforded the luxury to actually have conflict, which will then help you solve big problems and move your organization. And you can't have conflict unless you kind of dig each other. And let's be clear that psychological safety is not about necessarily being nice. It's about being respectful of the person in front of you. You're not going to be best friends with everybody that you work with. That's okay. But you should be able to go into healthy and passion debate so that you can build a better widget, a better process, a better whatever. That's how you do it. You can't. I would strongly, strongly emphasize you can't build anything in, in a better way without having impassioned debate or, or healthy conflict. It, it's impossible. I, and I really appreciate because it it's so easy to, if you don't understand it and you think of it as a bit fluffy, your psychological safety, you hear kumbaya on drums. <laughs> but if we're going to do trust, if we're going to do trust falls, I don't have to like you, but I have to trust that you'll catch me. That's it. <laughs> but we don't have to be friends. We don't. we don't have to be friends for it to work. And I think that all of a sudden, I think some of the detractors that I might know, some of my relatives that may be engineers, um, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. About George, you know who you are. You know who you are. Peter, um, other engineers. Yeah, you know. exactly. Yes, we all have. We all know. Well, it's funny. You know my other uncle as well. Interesting. I see you already messing my. Um, but that ability to like create a safe environment that we can quote unquote slug it out, because yeah. that's a term that sounds a little bit more. But at the end of the day, no one's actually going to get a black eye, and we're probably going to come to a better solution. It's not like we're going to sit around and smoke weed by the fire and and beat on the on the bongos. That's not what we're talking at about. All. And I think that it's easy to throw it into that bucket when you don't understand what it is and you, and you want to devalue it. Oh, that's just fluffy bullshit. And it, it's this. I'm like, well, actually, no, like you said, it's boxing gloves. They're just the ones you're not going to get hurt with. I think it's table <laughs> stakes. I think that um, yeah, I it's right. so important. And, and to go back to the nice statement, like I think we all know people running around the halls being super nice, right? The big happy face <laughs> and, hey, how's it going? I couldn't be any better if I blah, blah, blah. You know the people, right? But those people I don't necessarily trust. Your instinct just kind of goes up and goes, well, they're going to get me the second I turn my back, right? So it's not about being outwardly oh, nice. That's the opposite of psychological safety to your point. Right? Yeah. Well, then that's a good, I, I saw a meme the other day, or I don't know, some Instagram thing. It said, stop the glamorization of busy. I think we should stop the glamorization of nice as well. <laughs> oh, can I just, since you mentioned it, I, yeah, think, I think busy is the new F word. You oh, ask someone, hey, Tyler, how are you? Oh, my God, I'm busy. I'm so like, so busy. Blah. I'm so busy. <laughs> it just drives me crazy. We're all I know. Busy. And I did it today. We got on the call. I'm busy, but I'm like, well, what else is new? But here's actually what I'm doing, and, and, and I'm enjoying it. But you're right. It's stop the glamorization of busy and stop the glamorization of nice. And no, we all don't have to get along. <laughs> and, no, and nor do, I, do we all have to agree with each other's position, but it doesn't mean I hate you. <laughs> it just means I disagree. Exactly. And I... I think um, as we're talking about trust and psychological safety, I think that there is a delineation. I'd love to hear um, your point of view between trust and psychological safety. So trust for me is you and I trust each other, Tyler, but we're on a team and not every member trusts one another. So in order for a team to be, you know, deemed psychologically safe, Every single person has to have that relationship of trust. Mm. Be curious what you think of that. Yeah, I think of the two of them. Psychological safety for me is being able to show up who I am, being able to be a detractor from the common theme or the agreed upon idea and feel that that is so I, I trust in the fact that I'm going to be safe to bring up uh, something that takes away from maybe where the group is headed, just to oversimplify it. Where trust for me is like, do I trust that you'll follow a certain, op like, have we all agreed to act in a certain way? Do I trust that, I trust that you'll do what you said you were going to do when you say you're going to do it? Because we've all agreed that that's how we operate here. We, we're accountable to each other. We're helpful. We're resourceful. 
I'm, I'm listing off my values now at, at our company. <laughs> yeah, I, I trust that you're going to be helpful. But psychological safety, for me, I take that on so much more closer to my soul, like how I feel when I show up. And then the intern is then, am I providing that for other people? But the, when I hear psychological safety, it goes through a me voice first. Then the second one is, how am I going to feel showing up? Yeah. Then how am I going to be with you? The trust is, have we all agreed to act and 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 handle ourselves in a certain way? And then we actually can do it. I don't have to double check every time. Like, Karen, you are you are going to do that, right? Like, yeah, I said I was going to do it. You don't have to ask me again. That's where trust in an, in a day to day flow of of life to me shows up and psychological safety. It's a little bit more personal inward and then a little bit more outward secondary. Yeah. And I buy that. And I would add to that, that, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I wish you didn't. Cause that would be a good example of it right here. <laughs> Tyler, I think you're full of crap. Unfortunately, I <laughs> I'm think totally we're, too, joking. we're too similar. Um, we, we, yeah, we might've drank in the similar Kool-Aid this morning. I would, I would <laughs> add to that though and say that the leader in whatever we're talking about, whether it be psychological safety or trust, however you want to define that, the leader sets the tone. Has to demonstrate behavior. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you've ever been on a, like I've been yeah. on a team with a leader that, I mean, pontificates the opposite of any of what we're talking about right now, like shamed, belittled, did all of the stuff. Like, yeah, I guess the funny part is what's the opposite of, it's not just not having trust or not having safety. It's all those other things you just rammed off. Plus, plus, plus. Right. Yeah. You got to show up and oh, I got to put on this other armor. You know, I've got to be this way. And it's, it just doesn't feel very good. It's like you're white knuckling it through the day. Um, if you're on an unsafe team. Um, so, well, cause then you always the, you know, feel like you're on eggshells and what's going to blow up and when, and so what you do, you just start playing, playing small. I was watching a, uh, a video. We work with a, a large mining uh, contractor up in Northern Ontario. And, um, he sent me the, one of the guys, senior guys sent me a book, Safety by Accident. So I was watching some of the videos and they were talking about discipline in that environment. Like when you discipline someone for like they had a, they had an accident or a piece of equipment got damaged and then they were disciplined and everyone knew they got disciplined. And they're like, stop thinking it's going to change behavior. All you do is just remove discretionary effort and people show up and give you the bare bones minimum just to avoid getting in trouble. <laughs> so like just like it, it felt like in corporate, you don't necessarily get that same type of you know, we're going to dock you pay or we're going to do this because you had an incident on the job site. Uh, they were talking about it specifically more in that world than in the office space. But that same, that discretionary effort or that willingness to show up and do the little bit extra goes away instantaneously in a punishment type of thing. Yeah. I, you know, interesting as you were describing that, have you, have you seen the Netflix documentary Downfall? Oh, about Boeing? Yeah. Yes, I have. To me, that is a that everyone in corporate should watch that documentary. Everyone, if you're in, if you're in a business, in everyone in the period. But if you're in a business, and particularly yeah. if you're in a role like we're in Calgary or Alberta, if you're if there is safety as a concern, yeah. like we can t theorize about psychological safety and the leader sets the tone. And it, it's nice to be good to one another, but what happens when you have psychological safety and it's absent? in a safety organization. You work where people can act. Like I work in marketing, no one's going to die. But Nobody's gonna I know die. lots of guys that work on jobs, guys and gals that work on job sites where the consequence is you don't get to go exactly. home. Exactly. Right? And so with, exactly. Yeah. So with downfall, you know, I won't spoil it for everybody, but basically a new leader team comes in. They're more interested in profit than they are safety. And Boeing's known as a safety organization. Bunch of engineers raise their hand, say, hey, we've got a problem here. They push it aside. I mean, there's... A lot of those engineers got fired. You would get fired for bringing something up. That's a great documentary. I'm going to watch that. It, I actually think it should be table stakes for anybody in an organization. But you can see other like big examples in history. Like, look at the space shuttles. You know, oh yeah, I think we've all the O ring. O ring, times, exactly. That, that was wrong. based on an engineer wrong. going, "Excuse me, excuse me," and I believe someone called him like Chicken Little, like running around, like "Stop already! Like stop with your..." And then people die. So, you know, nurturing an environment of psychological safety isn't just a nice to have. I mean, if you're in a safety led organization, there are implications around life and death. Well, even as recent as this summer, the uh, that uh, that team of individuals that were taking their their homemade submarine down to the Titanic, yeah. and they all died, <laughs> and everyone was telling them it was a bad idea. Like, what are you doing? No, no, no. I'm, you know, a hard, you know, hard driving, gun toting, 
gunslinging, <laughs> yeah. you know, businessman. And, you know, that whole image we portray. Thank you, Hollywood, for all right. that. It, like, people can die. Like, but when it pays off, you're the hero. But when it doesn't, you and your friends passed away. Like, that's not a good scene. Like, the, when it's that binary, it's not worth it. For me. It's not worth the risk. Yeah. And I mean, I remember seeing, um, not a documentary, but like uh, like one of the morning shows on on the fellow that would, and it was ego based, right? Yeah, profit totally. based. So again, I don't think what we're talking about is just you know a nice to have. I think it's much bigger than 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 that. Do companies and I? Obviously, you're busy. You're flying over the country, so people are getting it, or they're seeming to get it, and they're reaching out. Does it often take an incident? Like what usually is the catalyst? Is it just that I've been to, I've watched enough Ted talks or I've read enough books also. I'm like, okay, my team's not working. Is it usually because a leader goes, wow, we're really not performing. So I've got to look at other options. What do you see as kind of the typical trigger set that gets you brought in? The- yeah, I would say culture. Culture's broken. Speaking of ambiguous terms. Right. <laughs> Thanks for calling me out on that. Oh, so you're saying it's because of stuff and things. <laughs> stuff and I things. Understand now. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about culture. Sorry, I couldn't resist. No, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, I can think of one organization right now. The CEO kind of looks around and says, like, what's going on? We're not, we're not kind of hitting our, our performance. It looks like people are really not digging each other. People have kind of quit and stayed on the job. We've got a lot of what I would consider actively disengaged people. If you look at the distribution of engagement, um, certainly nobody's got a growth mindset. Everybody's like, just, just get me out of the door at four o'clock. It's noon. I take, I I take my lunch at exactly noon. Right. So they're starting to see that what has happened to my company. And so ultimately, I think it comes down to psychological safety. I mean, there's a thousand topics that we cover in that 18 months or two years that I work with teams, like a thousand topics, right? Feedback, communication, all of that. But to me, it all comes down to, are you nurturing an environment where people can be vulnerable and be themselves? If you're doing that, your culture will reflect that. Um, your culture. Now I'm never going to be able to say culture yeah, no, again. I, no, no, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> but we're defining it. We're breaking it. We're, we're breaking it. But to be, there's always an underpinning. Like there's certain things in your life. If you get this as the foundation, other things. Like to your point, I love it. It's so easy to think that learning a new framework for feedback or learning a model of what a coaching session should feel like. None of that stuff does anything. It's all a waste of time, in my opinion, if it's not built on the base pyramid, go back to Lencioni, yeah. of trust and psychological safety and the ability to actually have rapport with that individual, that that then these communication frameworks will allow it to be more effective. But if you don't, me running in with a new framework and look, I, tr- I learned a new leader. I went to a leadership course on the weekend. I have a new framework, but you don't trust me. Like <laughs> throw it out the window 100. and it could be a perfectly good framework. It could be perfectly good. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> like, Oh, you're going to teach me about the 700 levels of listening or this feedback model or coaching model, or whatever. <laughs> like none of it matters. None of it matters. If you, don't have... if you don't have as the individual, the intent of first of all, just being human to another human being, which is kind of psychological safety. I think psychological safety yeah, is a sounds old fashioned human again. right. In these old fashioned concepts. <laughs> You know, someone asked me the other day, like, Carolyn, what do you do? I'm like, um, it was super interesting because I usually say, yeah, I'm a consultant and I do all this leadership yep. stuff and all that stuff. And I found myself kind of pausing and I said, you know what I do? I teach others how to be nice to each other or to be kind to one another. That's I teach grownups specifically. <laughs> I, I teach grownups how to be kind to one another. And I think at the heart of it. Well, and how did they react? Did they know you well or no, not? Because that's a like I, I, the look on their face must have been awesome. Like, um, look, it's either tell me more or they run away. <laughs> it's like felt like it'd be very polarizing. It's a good way to vet your audience, real quick. I just think it's a, a less arrogant way of presenting myself. I think that's ultimately what I do, and I'm here to serve. And I know that sounds very Pollyanna. It really does. But when I'm down dirty in a workshop or I'm working with someone. All I want to do is help. And I think where I can help is to crack op- crack them open a little bit by saying kindness is really 
the only thing that you need, whether it be at home or at work, and recognize that everybody that you meet, everybody that you meet has a story. So, you know, everybody, the kind of like everybody's going through something. Everybody. And I I know, I know that sounds like people say it and it's whatever, but if you genuinely approach every interaction that you have in a day with the intent of everybody's got something going on, then there's no need to be um, unkind, whatever that looks like. Doesn't mean we don't all have bad days and we're not going to be angry or this or that, but Generally, if the baseline, you know, our mean, our mean line is we're going to be as kind as humanly possible, recognizing we're all human beings. I think that's the secret sauce to leadership. And we could just mic drop and that would be the end of it. There's so, there's such a powerful, um, I love it because you boiled it down to just all like, if you can't make it simple, like give it more time, I'd make it shorter kind of mindset, like make it simple, make it clear to understand. And you're right. There's so many, you can't turn anywhere to go. Hmm. Even if I've been dismissed, dismissing this for years, I think some of my older white male leaders, and I'm going to very, be very stereotypical, but I'm in a leadership group and there's some, some old white guys in there and I'm, I'm, I'm joking. They know who yeah. they are. Uh, and I see them, a couple of them, I had a conversation. They're like, ah, like, it's just so the opposite of way we went through the system, but we can't be blind to the fact that it's different now and it feels uncomfortable for us, but we have to learn. I'm speaking in broad, like just broad groups and throwing people into buckets. But I think of some of the group, but I see some of these individuals that I know that are in that, that have been on the journey of this was not part of how they grew up through corporate and like they're in the later phases of their careers. And all of a sudden they're discovering this sense of themselves and the sense of empathy and the sense of caring that just never had a place for them. But I think it was probably for a lot of them was actually who they were, but it got beaten out of them a little bit earlier in their careers, like 30, 40 years. And they're wrestling now to bring it back in a way that you can see them get emotional because they're just not used to having it as something that showed up. Because it can, if you're um, not used to that, it can be, it, emotions are overwhelming. They're powerful for a reason. Well, I had a, thank you for sharing that. I was in a workshop last uh, week in which I was graduating um, a, a class we had been together for two years and i found myself giving um each of the each of the the members there was it was a small group kind of feedback and one of the gentlemen who happened to be a fairly senior person in an organization got quite emotional and i said what's going on and he goes honestly i don't i don't i don't know the last time someone has provided me recognition that has been so powerful and I think that's what you're tapping into. And my response was, we I mean, had a conversation around this, but it came down to comfort zone. So comfort zone is the mental home in which you live, right? You show up at, you know, you wake up at six, you have lunch with the same people, shit, it's dancing with stars night, whatever. Like, it's all very comfortable, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and I firmly believe that all new learning happens when we're outside of that comfort zone, whatever that looks like. And that that grows and retracts um, over the years. And so my encouragement with leaders is to, if it feels uncomfortable, good. That means you're learning something or you're feeling something that is unusual. Actually treat it as an, as an, indi- as an indicator, not something to move. Exactly. Away. Exactly. Move, move it, move it, move into that space. Crystal ball time. Mm-hmm. Um, Leadership teams are in crisis. I keep pulling that one back because I agree. And you're not the first. You're not the first person who's said that in in the way that you said it. So it seems to be a universal theme. Having so many different people on the show right now, having these conversations. Although this is a show about economic transformation, and if you're going to transform your organization, you got to have to get really good at this stuff, or it's not going to work. One hundred percent. Where Where are we headed? Are we just on the journey, and it is exactly that? Do you see? Oh, as we. Because every time we level up a little bit, we just discover new things to level up to. But hopefully the old stuff, we change that neuroplasticity, we rewire, we refire, we kind of change the pathways. Thinking about the organization um, as a working brain of pathways and ways that we do things, are we just slowly kind of building up the ladder to the next level? What's your hope as well as your kind of thoughts on what the next five years look like from a leadership and team dynamics and just this topic in general? I definitely am an optimistic by trade, Tyler. Um, I don't know, though, right now, 
if I'm going to be really candid with what I'm observing. Oh, Carolyn, you're getting super, we're getting fireside getting chatty. Kind fireside of chatty. I'm going to bring my voice down nice and low. You are, you do. You went, you, you actually, I felt that was a fireside voice. I felt it. I don't know. I just, I do see teams and leader teams reverting back to pre-pandemic time. And it's like, I'm desperate to, to, show them the mirror that look at what we've learned here. We've shown some humanity. We've shown some love. Um, and so that neuroplasticity that you're talking about, we're not practicing all of those soft skills that we we had the opportunity to practice during the pandemic, showing that vulnerability. Well, we were forced. Let's be candid. We, we were, were forced kicking and screaming to practice it. Or we were very isolated very quickly, right? I would argue. You know, again, broad sweeping statement. Yeah, but I like... Uh, some kind of universal gift in some way. Again, I know there's massive tragedy I, I also here. choose to, I, yeah, I choose to find it that way. I think COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me because I changed significant things in my life that I probably never would have done without that big lift. Me too. But yes, it was, ter- it was terrible. I chose to dig for the gold everywhere. Me I too. <laughs> me too. My yeah. life is dramatically different. And my hope is, is, you know, crystal ball is that we'll continue to stretch our comfort zones around and learning how to develop trusting relationships at home and at at, uh, at work. But my sense is that we're going to revert back. Um, that's my sense. I don't. What's your sense? I'm starting to see almost draconian level tactics, yeah. especially around the return to office. Let's just make yeah, it yeah let's way. do that. We're going to check your fob. We're going to make sure that you just like scanned in at 8 a.m. and you and you didn't scan out again until f- I'm like, where are we? What world are we living yeah. in? Like things like that. I've heard from friends of mine and more Ottawa, Toronto, just in the financial sector. Yeah. And a lot of those companies are like, yeah, no problem. You can live from anywhere. Move to Ottawa now. Oh, we spec you in the office four days a week and you have to swipe your fob every morning by 801 yeah. or someone will contact you. I'm like, what? Yeah. What the hell is that? Yeah. Like. Oh, but no, we really want you to love working here, but we're going to lord over you yeah. and, and, you know, we'll, we'll free, we'll, we'll fire, like, we'll, there's consequences that are negative. If you don't participate in these very command and control at just the way of swiping in and managing, ma- managing your spot card. That's the one that resonated with me. Cause I'm like, what is happening people? What did we learn? Nothing. Like, what are we doing? My only... Because we've got expensive real estate and we got to put bodies in it and all of these things. So I think you're right. I think that there's a great conversation that's going on. And I tend to talk to a lot of people that are living in it like you. So I get bit rose colored glasses. Then I talk to my friends that are just working in quote unquote, whatever company pick one. And some of the things that are going on, I'm like, Oh wow. Like it, we're not going back to before 2019. We're going back to like 1982. Or I don't know what, I don't know where we're going back to, but it feels like we've kind of exaggerated and whiplash back too far in, in a lot of kind of tight. The silver lining though, Tyler is, and we, I think we've ascertained that we're a fairly similar age, but where <laughs> we have, which will, which will remain unspoken of because there's no need to talk. Once you certain, once you read a certain point, I've heard there's no need to speak about it. It doesn't right. matter. Anymore. Um, I do think there is this <laughs> glimmer of wonderful hope around the Gen Zs and Ys and whatever the, the brand new one is. Because here's the deal with these guys. And I've done a bunch of one-on-one interviews just because I just am so keenly interested in their voice and hybrid and how do you want to show up at work. Um, their thing is going to be, you tell me the desired end goal, whatever that is. Yeah, that all and I'll do it in tuck to tuck if I want to. Don't you tell me where I need to do this. In addition to this generation that I've studied, they, they care. They give a shit. They, hmm. part of their attraction into an organization is, how are you changing the world in any way, in any way, shape, or form? It's not about profit. I can have massive generalizations here. There's not. Of course, we still want to be well compensated. We yeah. still like, of course, there's still, there's a certain layer that has to be maintained, right? Because you still have to live in a for the world you live in, of course. So it's not that, oh, I don't care about money. Yes, I do. But it's maybe not my main, what's never has been the main driver just always gets pointed to as the main driver, right? That's always the misnomer about Well, money. money's just a hygiene thing, right? You get it, you get it right. Nobody talks yeah, about it, so, right? Totally. Um, yeah, yeah, to, to, yes. If you get it right, nobody talks about it. Yeah, right. and you get it wrong. That's all you're talking about, right? Yeah. So I think with this generation, they're they're going to teach us something, and I love the fact that they have a philanthropic underbelly to how they show up in the universe. I think it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think that they, again, you're not going to tell them to sit under fluorescent lights for eight hours a day, five days a week. It's not going to happen. You make me, you make me, you make me cringe. Just <laughs> right? say, uh, I had a speaker that come to my executive group and all he researched was demographics. And he, and he said, you know, and he, he made us sit around the room from the boomers all the way around the table to the youngest individual. It was funny because we had like a 25 year old and like a 70 year old. It was yeah. awesome. And then he'd go around the room and say, what do you guys feel about this? And they'd say something and then they'd go to the other side and they'd be like, are you nuts? Like, it was awesome to watch it. And he said, he goes, listen, like the command and control that you all have to be in the office, we're in the death rows because some of those people in those senior leadership are, are just not dead yet. They're just not gone. <laughs> goes, it's moving this way and you all can hold on to it all you want, you boomers and even you, you, you. But fundamentally, this new generation is coming on and they're demanding something different. And soon they will become the leaders of tomorrow and they'll just change it. <laughs> so think about it what you will. And people were pointing, he's like, well, yeah, but what about over there? And he said, yeah, it's just a time thing and it's running its course because those individuals are soon going to be running. They're going to be making the decisions and you're going to be out. So it's not going to matter. What totally. You. And it was awesome because he was so matter of fact. And he's like, demographics don't lie. He goes, it's like predicting the future while studying the past. He goes, just how it is. You can say what you want. This is where it's headed. <laughs> and I loved his matter of fact presentation style. And I sat right in the middle and I'm leaning more to the, I'm with you. I'm skewing more to the other side. The well, other side Cause that's what I like. That's what I value. Do. And let's just remind each other here where the command and control thing came from. I think we often think, Oh, well that just was an effective thing out there. It came from the industrial revolution where you need, it originally came from the Roman. It was the Roman. It originally came from the well, Roman. Well, there military. you go. Where that made sense. It's literally a military. It was 100%. Like, exactly. It go way back. It was never a warm and fuzzy strategy from the like, get go. That just, we don't know anything better. So no, let's just you keep listen to it. me. Otherwise, you die. Right? That's command and control. <laughs> where does that have any yeah. fit into modern leadership technique? I got into an argument with a leader of, like, a couple of years. It was fun. We were having, we we're out for sushi, having a few stockies. And, you know, <laughs> I wish it was like the old days. I was like, Peter, what do you mean the old days? And he goes, well, you know, when you could just tell people what to do and they do it. I said, like what? When you've lost the ability to threaten to kill their family? <laughs> and we got into this whole joke. I'm like, what is modern management just because I can't starve you out or kick you off the land? And then it's like, well, when you say the good old days, when are you actually referring right. to? And he just got mad and curmudgeon. He just wanted people to do what he said. And, but we could not identify this good old days period that he seemed to be taught to Tony. Yeah, that because I can't kill your family. The need for modern management. <laughs> yeah, and I think back in the day, hierarchy made sense, right? Whether it be you know, it was a different. It was a different world, is what we're like, and 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 in every way, shape, or and form. hierarchy makes zero sense. Now you need someone that kind of you know, the buck stops somewhere, but you know, to to put a hierarchy on human value, and that's what we're doing when we're we're condescending mm -hmm. to people. I don't care if you're, a, you know, I'm the CEO and you're the whatever. We're all, again, human beings. And so, you know, it's funny. I went into a um, a new client uh, a couple of weeks ago and I hadn't met any of the senior team yet. And I walked in and someone was um, uh, cleaning up. It looked like spilled coffee or something. And I said, I'm here to see the CEO. Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, that's me. And he was the one cleaning up the coffee. I said, what are you doing? Oh, that, yeah, yeah. Like, we've heard that in books and stuff. But here I saw it for the first time in action. He goes, ah, I spilled my coffee. I said, I'm sure there's someone that could help you with that. He goes, nah, no, no. I'll do it myself. No, my, my, my mom raised me to clean up house right? myself. Like, and that just, in that act, told me. Well, for you, that must have been an amazing, like, oh, wow, I just learned so much about this organization through reading this. And I want to work with We'll them. see if it holds together. I want to work with yeah. you because you are already there, right? You're already there in terms of mindset. Hmm. Well, that's an, ex that's an excellent mic drop. Well, Carolyn, what a fun I conversation. Know. I was so looking Thank forward. You. We, you know, you and I could just wow, <laughs> go all day and get into the wine and just chat for hours. Uh, but I really love, and like you said, I think we have a lot of overlap in our Venn diagram when it comes to this stuff. But I do appreciate that you live and breathe in it every day. And I do love your, you know, there's, there's optimism, but there's a little fear that we might like the, the, re, the, the recoil might be too far, right? We might overcompensate back in another direction. It's unfortunate, but that will pass. And then we'll go the other way. We have a hard time to hit the middle, don't we? <laughs> Just in general. <laughs> mm, I bounce off one wall and I bounce off the other guardrails. Yeah. So we need some self-driving here to keep us in the lanes. But, okay. Talk, talk. How do people get a hold of you? 
yeah, so you're on LinkedIn. What's your, what's, I guess maybe the question, what's your favorite form of communication? Cause there's a million. <laughs> How do you like people to reach out? Um, well, you can find us at talkdoc.ca. You can um, send me an email, Carolyn I-N-E. That's a whole other story. You know, I'm now saying Carolyn. Uh, thanks mom. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn at talktalk.ca. Um, yeah, any of the social media um, platforms. Are fine. Yes, all of the channels. All, all, all of the, all channels, the channels I am on, yes. Yes, very cool. Well, I loved our conversation. I love your energy and clearly you're bought into this journey and you're making it you know, one leader at a time, one team at a time. And uh, I love to be able to support the work you do and share your philosophy. So thanks for coming on the show. This has been an old, absolute pleasure. Probably one of my favorite conversations this year, Tyler. So thank you so much. I'm going to put that right Please at the beginning. Do. I'm going to start the Testimonial. podcast with that, with that audio. Testimonial. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute joy. I always joke in my audience to start to hear it. I would do this if no one listened. I'm glad that they do because it justifies the hobby a little bit. But I, you, to... The lost art of just having a good talk talk with someone. This was an excellent talk talk. Thank you. Talk talk. Thank you, Tyler.